you look at certain scriptures in the Bible, there's a tendency to think of God as a partial God. You know, and certain statements are often making seem so. Sometimes when individual human beings also who are God's children, who believe in Him and know Him as the creator and sustainer of the universe, are going through some situations in their lives. They may tend to get to a point where they wonder whether God is truly out there, whether He is watching out for them. And it looks as if God is taking care of some people better than taking care of some people. You know, why is that person enjoying and why am I not enjoying? And we may be wondering whether God is a partial God. Incidentally, when you look at events or statements in the scriptures that tend to almost maybe make us wonder whether God is partial, or even events in our lives that may make us wonder whether God is partial, they actually have method. Like they will say, oh, human beings, this man's madness has a method. <laughs> The things God does that often doesn't make sense to us actually has a method. And it is revealed in the plan of salvation he applied in those holy days. I remember when I was 17 and I started reading the materials that uh, in the Bible correspondence course, the World Wide Church of God. And as I was going through the last four lessons that were dealing with the holy days, the feast that God has given to the children of Israel and the significance of those feasts for the future. It boggled my mind and I came to the Day of Atonement and I came to the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day and I looked at the meaning and it opened my eyes to things and concepts that have bothered me as a young man. A statement where God said, Israel is my firstborn son. What is special about Israel? Remember, in Deuteronomy, Moses said that you people, that is the Israelites, you are stubborn, stiff-necked people. And he said it's not because you guys chose God, you are special, but God chose them. So they are stubborn, stiff-necked people. Look at all the things God did in their lineage, in their history. And yet, repeatedly, even when he took ten mighty miracles to get them out of Egypt, repeatedly, the scripture says ten times, they grumbled against God, isn't it? So why didn't God choose the people of Egypt? Why didn't he choose the Canaanites? Why did he specifically single out Israel and say, I'll make you a model nation? For what reason? Jacob and Esau and their mother's womb, right? What did God say to Rachel? The younger or the older shall serve the younger. They were still in their womb. They haven't formed any opinions or done anything. They have not made any choices. And yet God said, Esau, I love less or I hate And Jacob, I love. The scripture talks of a calling according to a selection, isn't it? The scripture says many are called. It didn't say all are called. It says few are chosen. Paul talked about the predestined to be conformed as many as are predestined, which means God chose certain people to come to conform to understanding or to knowledge of his will. So what is the reason why he's doing that? Again, that concept, I don't want to use the word madness, actually has a method. It actually brings out God's love and wisdom. Okay? When we go through difficult situations, things are a little bit tight for us. So our expectations are not as we expect things will turn out. We sometimes wonder whether we're important enough to God. And remember the definition of faith in Hebrews 11. It talks about the evidence of things not seen and the assurance of things hoped for. And then it talks about he who must worship God, must know or believe that he is, that he exists. I personally look at that statement as very cardinal to how we who call ourselves children of God should anchor ourselves in the knowledge that he has given us so that we are unshakable. So today, I have a sermon title that I have called You Matter, 
people matter. You matter and people matter. We need to know without a shadow of a doubt, without a shred of a doubt, that we matter to God. We are important to God. And all human beings, every single one created, the Egyptians, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, the people of Nineveh, the Canaanites, the Amalekites, and all those people in the land of Canaan that God asked the Israelites to go in and destroy them, men, women, and children. They all matter to God. Billions of Muslims in this world, China and India, the most populous nations on this planet, 1.5 billion, 3.5 billion people. Now that's a lot. We call ourselves the giant of Africa, in quotes, in terms of our population only, I believe. Maybe our intellect or our drive, too, maybe. And we're roughly about between 160 to 250. The, the, the population continues to change, so to say. All right? So, what is 1 billion? I'm not talking about 4 billion, 3.5 billion. That's huge. You know, the majority of people in China do not even believe in God. They worship their ancestors. Which of us decided where we would be born? I bet any of us, if we could choose as children, choose where you are going to be born. Who will ask to be born in Nigeria? <laughs> Probably very few. <laughs> Almost none. I beg, born me in Ohio City or Cincinnati or in New York or in, we will choose somewhere abroad. So those people born in China, those people born in Saudi Arabia, those people born in Russia or in India, mostly Hindus and Muslims, they didn't choose to be born like that. And yet, we know that there's no salvation in anyone except Christ. And these people do not know Christ. The population of Christians in India can be considered like a drop of water in this big room. Yet, that was where Timothy, no, not Timothy, Thomas, that was where he went. You notice in the scriptures, you don't read the accounts of the rest of the apostles. You read about Peter, John, maybe about James. What of Bartholomew? What of Thaddeus? What of James, son of Alphaeus? What of you know, one of the sons of Zebedee. What of all the other people, Philip and the rest of them? Where did they go? Each one of those people in India and in China, each one of those people in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in Iraq, all those Muslims who have sworn to kill everyone who believes in Jesus Christ and Messiah, they all matter to God. Most importantly, I'm going to start with the fact that you matter to God. You matter. And if we understand that we matter to God, maybe we will, I'm hoping in perspectives, when we look at things happening around us, or things that are happening to us, and by extension, every individual that is around us, we will also value them the way God values us. Because God values us, He places a great deal of value on us. And by extension, we should place a great deal value on ourselves as well. And the people that God has placed us on this planet with, I'm not talking of your friend or I'm talking of your husband, I'm not talking of my friend, I'm talking of your neighbor or my neighbor, I'm not talking of people that you know or you work with, I'm talking of anyone who is a human being. Every individual, they matter to us and they should matter to us because they matter to God. Look at this um, scripture. We know what this Picture is right. Not sure. Okay. Yeah. Now you see, right? This is a baby in the womb. And in Psalm 139, verse 14, look at what David wrote. Psalm 139, verse 14. He says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I just love reading David's writings. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
as a biochemist, studying how cells divide and multiply, and how proteins are formed, I can relate to this statement, and I do not expect, and I know for a fact, that David does not even know that there are cells in the body when he wrote this. But with the little knowledge he had, the insight he could look at, his understanding about God, he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And he says, your works are million dollars, sorry, wonderful. It's not just wonderful. I know that full well. Do you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? Do you know that this person sitting next to you, not in the bus, not in the, in the hall here, actually in the bus on your way home, if you enter the bus, or that you drove past if you drove yourself here, or that you can see sitting in the middle of the road, maybe a beggar, or that you can see who is walking things on the road. Do you know that the person that you See when you open your eyes and outside and you see someone out there, it doesn't matter whether you know them or not, that that individual is fearfully and wonderfully made and is the works of God's hand. Look at how it is rendered, verse 13 of that same uh, Psalm 139. In the New Living Translation, verse 13. Verse 13, in the New Living Translation. And it reads, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. This is a soldier talking. Soldiers have to learn which organs can be pierced to kill someone. They need to know which place can be punched to cause damage. They know that the inner parts of the human being is delicate. Delicate means it's fragile. It can easily affect the whole. It can easily be, you know, put in jeopardy. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Knit me together in my mother's womb. I want us to put that in our head, to start with. Let us remember that always, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God took time to design intricately every part of you. I doubt if anyone will see me and mistake me for who The only person you probably might mistake for me, maybe when it's my age, is my son. There was a time we wore the same dress. The week. We wear the same clothes. I think the same clothes. Ruth was wearing it there. And in the office. And I think someone was saying, I passed. And then Ruth was passing. And it's like, ah, that, I, was, I just passed right now. Where am I coming from again? He's a little taller than me now. <laughs> He's wearing the same trouser size I'm wearing. Can you imagine? In fact, in fact, if, the, if I wear, if he wears my trouser now, it will be short. It will look like my Jackson trouser. <laughs> but we are all facially different. Seven point something billion people in the planet, and it's so difficult to see lookalikes. There are lookalikes, right? Almost double genders. But you will look and you can even identical twins that some people cannot fully identify. There are those who can still identify identical twins. Parents don't mistake their red cartoons. Okay? You will expect that with seven point something billion people on the planet, there should be people who will easily really look like each other. That you will see this one, is this Ruth or is this somebody else? I thought I saw you there, I said, no, that's not you. And yet they are not sisters, they are not related. But yet, people who look like one another are rare. Okay? They are rare. So we are important to God. And that's how, that's why God took time to make all of us individually. As we are forming in our mother's womb, God watched over us because we are important to Him. By extension, my focus here is every individual we see on this planet is important to God. And we need to recognize that fact. 
if we are that important, we're that valuable. Do we think someone will take time to build something, to craft something, and then he will leave it to the elements, he will leave it to, for anything to happen to it? Of course not. We will see that. In this world especially, oftentimes the young ones, and even sometimes the educated ones, they often have people they call celebrities that they admire and worship. I've seen videos where people like Michael Jackson will be playing music, and people will be screaming. And one that is very funny to me, and I've seen it with various celebrities, Michael Jackson will be like, oh, I love you. You see, as his hand is doing like this, people are just thinking, oh, oh, ah. <laughs> If he tears his clothes and throws that clothes outside, people will fight to get a piece of that cloth. Someone will take a hair of Michael Jackson. You know if you have a hair, you can say this is Michael Jackson's hair, you can actually sell that hair for millions of dollars right now. Right now, you become a millionaire that you have a piece of his hair. I wish somebody would take my hair. I really appreciate it for them. <laughs> Fearfully and wonderfully made. Celebrities, actors, and stars, we know them simply because we feel they are, they've done something important. They are in music, they are in entertainment, you know, they are in important places, so we know them. We consider them as valuable, we consider them as noteworthy. Who doesn't know in Lagos, Baba Jiraji Fashala? Before he became a governor, I had never heard about him. Now, those in politics who might know about, I mean, I'm sure he didn't just come out of nowhere to become a governor. I'm sure he was in maybe Senate or something like that over time, isn't it? But we, most of us probably didn't know a single thing about him until he became governor of Lagos State. And then his name and his picture is everywhere. Current governor of Lagos State. How many of you have heard, him, heard of him before in his candidates for governor? Baba Nide, Olushola Sonwolu. How many people have heard of his name before his candidates for governor? I have not. But all of a sudden, we know who he is. Because he's important now. We figure out his important and significance. And you know what? Those are the kind of people of time we think matter. People that have achieved something, people that seem to be in a certain position, a certain place, we figure they're the ones who matter. They're the ones who sometimes feel we should value and respect or look up to. How many people here do not know Oprah Winfrey? Quite a lot of people know who Oprah Winfrey is. Okay? Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ramsey Noah, maybe Sandra Chan, Jennifer, Jennifer, Nanji. Those are some actors and actresses that we know. And you just need to look at some fashion magazine or some entertainment magazine and you see all those pictures and you see them and everybody notices and knows who they are. There's this man, I don't know his name, who used to be very funny. He's a little bit big with spot belly like this. And he used to ask, you know, he both things. Very, very funny, very jovial guy. I don't even know his name, but I've seen him in some African magic movies. A number of times I've entered playing with him coming from away. When the guy gets to the airport like this, normally anyone comes to the airport and you are queuing to actually, you know, check him. This guy comes to the airport when he wants to queue. People are greeting him and they are oh, just go, 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 go and get your tickets. Ah, may I go? And you know what? If everybody is there standing in the line before and everybody is already like, ah, these people are too slow, so so and so. The man comes, even the people complain that they are, the line is too slow, we let the guy go forward. And he's cracking jokes and people are laughing along the entire line and he doesn't laugh. He will just say those words like this, everybody is laughing and they are cracking jokes. And he gets in front, he gets. Even the plane coming back in the plane, he would just say those things like that, just draw them like that, but he's laughing, 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 laughing. He's a celebrity, people notice him. To people, he matters, he's known. There are also some people who matter not only because they have done something for us, but because of some tragic situation or incidences. Let me give you some examples. We know what happened 9-11, right? Maybe there are some children, that's like 18 years ago. 9-11, 2001, I was sitting down in Joba, 
and I was, I was watching this on CNN. And it played and played for weeks as these events took place. This is what happened. The bombing of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. Guess what? I used to read it a lot. But until that time, 9-11, the truth is, I never knew that there was a Twin Towers in New York. How many of you knew before this incident that was a Twin Tower? I never knew that was a Twin Tower. Over 100 stories high in New York, World Trade Center. I never knew about it. But this incident, this event, made it something that everybody is aware of. There were two airlines that were crashed into these two towers. People were jumping from the roof. Over 400 plus firefighters and policemen died. I was watching as people were rushing to try to get up, and firemen were rushing to try to go up. They believed it was their job to save people's life, even to cost them their life. And as some of them were dying, more people were rushing up to go and take their place. And many people who were on reserve, even retired, were hugging their families and wishing them farewell, and they were rushing to the stations to see, do you have a spare uniform for me? Do we have a spare uniform for me? And people went there and they risked their life. It was the highest, most costliest, most deadliest terrorist attack in the history of the US. You know how many people died in that attack? The record says there were over 297 people who died. 2,997 people died in that attack. The aftermath of the 9 11, okay? How many people died? 2,000 plus people died. Before this 9 11, how many of you have heard of Osama bin Laden? Who doesn't know Osama bin Laden now? In fact, it often used to be a joke. Somebody who has beard like this. People used to have beard like this before, and just, I mean, they're like archers or prophets. These days, you know, people say, ah, are you trying to be Osama bin Laden? World Trade Center, a terrible attack, made Osama become popular, isn't it? Al Qaeda became popular. Hezbollah used to be the ones most people be hearing about there. You know, the terrorist groups in Israel that used to attack Israel and go and they are masked. Al Qaeda just jumped into limelight. 2,977 people died. 2,977 people. Now, 19 terrorists took place, took part in this attack. They also attacked the Pentagon on that same day. And they were also trying to take a plane to the Capitol Hill, where the president used to be. But the uh, people in the plane heard about what they somehow knew what was happening in World Trade Center, and they knew was they were going to try and attack the presidential something. And people risked their lives, they attacked the terrorists, they overpowered them, and the plane still crashed. All the people in all those four planes died. Nobody survived. All of them died. That tragic event made those people become known. Taliban become known. Until that time, how many people have heard of this name? Even me, I've never have heard of this name. Mrs. Guzman. I will never have known who is Mrs. G. Guzman, Janelle Guzman. I doubt if anybody here knew who Janelle Guzman is. Ask an average American who lived during that time. It was at least adults, mature. Even children, because they are teaching them in schools. Janet Guzman was the 18th survivor that was pulled out of the rubble of the World Trade Center. This rubble that you can see on this place. The 18th survivor at 12.30 p.m. that night. I mean, that afternoon. She was pulled out alive and well. And the last one. That made her significant. That made her known. So history is talking about her. And the children are learning about that. Oh, how many people survived the World Trade Center for me? Only 18 person. Who was the last person saved? You know, it can be, it's not a test. The woman has gone into history. Because she, it seems she's not significant. It's not only a tragic situation that should make it significant. But people are learning about it. They made a memorial to the World Trade Center. And the memorial made is to make sure the names of all those 2977 people are known. There's a place called the Memorial Park. 
It's huge, and this is how it looks. This is how it looks. And it is actually engraved on the four walls, inside and outside. They engraved the names of every one of those people. We didn't have us. They got the names, they got a photograph of everyone who died in that building. And there's a reason they were doing that. If you read accounts about it on Wikipedia and various sites, they will tell you that the world wants to remember the event. And it wants to let people know that those people didn't just die. They may have been insignificant before that event, but they are important still. They may not be president. There was only one journalist who died. He actually was able to bypass all the court and people were trying to take him. He snuck inside. He knew he was not going to survive. He went there. In fact, as the last tower was crumbling on him, he was taking video and recording, and he protected that camera with his body and died. Can you imagine? Now, technically, you'll have been almost the only one you say is significant, but everyone, they wanted them to be significant. And what they did was to write their names, and they engraved those names as a constant reminder so that people will know that these people may be people who don't, nobody knows about. They're not, they've not achieved much in life. But the fact that they died in that terrorist attack, they're important people, and we don't want to forget their names. Something else they did. This picture that you see here is written, is put together. All they did was they just wrote the names of all those nine, 2,977. That's what made up this picture. All those people's names wrote them together. And they have immortalized them. That these people are significant and they're important. Now, if we individuals can go to great lengths to immortalize the names of people who have, have perished or died in tragic events. How much more the one who said he created us? And that David said, fearfully and wonderfully crafted us. Now we live in a country where the value of life may not mean much. How many children were kidnapped by the Boko Haram that they took from this school in the north? How many children? How many people remember the name of the town? Okay, probably because they kept saying in the news, Chibok girls, Chibok girls, Chibok girls, Chibok girls. Some people may not even know how many numbers. The names of all those children. Have you heard that there is a monument to the names of those children? The ones who returned and the ones who did not return. Again, it's because we live in a country where things like that are not important. Do you think any of those parents or those children will ever forget in 20 years that their kids were taken away? Do you think they will ever forget? They can't. That significant event that happened has embedded it in their minds. And even those who know those children, their friends, can never forget that. They can never Forget that. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. This is God talking. Matthew 10, 29. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. God is saying that as cheap as it is for people to buy spouse, those are just birds, animals, things that are not valuable like human beings. Because when God created man, he said, I'm creating him in my image, in his image. And he said, let them have dominion. In Hebrews 2, Paul was writing about man that is made a little lower than the angels, so that all things will be subject to him. That even though right now you don't see all things subjected to him, but that's God's purpose. And so he's saying, these birds that are almost nothing to us, that we will sell them so cheaply, he says, not even one of them falls down to the ground without God's knowledge. 
Very right, right. My point here is this. Every single person living on this planet matters to God. Everyone matters to God. They may seem unimportant. They may seem inconsequential. They may not be people we see them or we know. As long as they are breathing on this planet, of the 7.3 billion people on this planet, they all matter to God. All of them, they matter to God. You know when Christ, how do you know they matter to God? What was the reason? Why did Jesus Christ decide to come and die on the cross? What do we think? You know, they put him to the cross like this. They nailed him to the cross, right? Here's what I say. It wasn't the nails in the hands of Christ or on his feet that held him to the cross. It was love that kept him there. Do we think he could not have stopped himself from being captured? You know, there's a time when he said, before Abraham was, I am. And the people got angry and they wanted to kill him. The scripture says he just walked away from him. It's not the equivalent of a baby in your vow. He just became invisible, or if he's just only invisible and not intangible, even if you are invisible, as you are walking through the crowd, people will know something is bumping them. But he became not just invisible, he became also intangible, like a ghost. He walked through them, they didn't see him. And once he was outside, he would become himself. And people they didn't, they couldn't find him. They, they could have done the same when they came to capture him in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know why he left himself there? Hebrews 2, I mean, Philippians 2 says so. That he emptied himself. He chose. He even said so in talking to the disciples that it is of his own free will that he gave his life. It was his love for you, for me, for every single individual ever created that will also be born, that kept him on that cross. And what does that tell us? It tells us that what we do for one another is important in God's eyes. What we do for one another is important in God's eyes. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Let's read just one verse, verse 40. We know the story, okay? And I was telling them about, you know, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was freezing, I was this, I was this. And at the end of it, those people said, they were asking, when were you hungry? When were you thirsty? When were you naked? When were you in prison? When did all this happen that you are telling us you did this? And this was his statement to them in verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, verily, verily, I say to you, as I used to say in the old Indian, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Christ is saying, even someone that we might think is the least important, the least significant, so who do you think is the most insignificant person that God has placed around you today? Who do you think it is? Christ is saying that the significant person matters in life. That what you do or don't do for them makes matter, you know, makes some sense to him. And it impacts his choice on how he relates or deals with us when he comes. That what we do, how we relate to them, and how we see them, and how we value them, and how we interact with them is of great importance. Himself. That's what Christ is saying. We can't risk so much, deny ourselves of so much, take so many ridicules, walk away from so many opportunities just for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the kingdom. Only for us at the last minute, because we do not value or we not see as very important as mattering to God, someone that is around us, ah, this one is beneath me. This one is too small for me to. Who, who, who is this person? Oh, no, 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 this person doesn't make matter. No, this is somebody that doesn't 
are what? There's no celebrity. No, there's no reason why I should take note of that. There's no reason why I should be, you know, concerned about them. Only because of those things that we could have done, that Christ would say, depart from me, I do not know you. And the people were asking him, if you read the whole, the last verses of those places, that ah, but when were you hungry? When were you thirsty? When were you naked? When were you in prison or sick? That we didn't actually feed you or visit you or give you clothes or try to be nice to you or take care of you. And they say, as long as you don't do it to this little one, this significant, the smallest of this one, the most insignificant of this ones, you say that you haven't done it to me. And these are people obviously who are sure that they're supposed to be with him. And he's saying, you know what? If these people around you don't matter to you, then it means I don't matter to well. you. You can't look at me because I'm so high up, or because of what you think I can give you, or because of what I can get from you. That's what makes me significant of matters to you. No, if you know that I value, that I, that I am important to you, that you value me, then value these little ones. Value all these people that are placed around you. So you matter to God, people matter to God, and as far as God is concerned, we understanding that concept is, and how we respond to the people around us, and how we see how He sees us, and respond to that, in order, whatever situation we find ourselves, is part of what we want to do. It's incidental that most people don't understand this is an attitude that Christ has. It's part of His mindset, part of who He is. Okay? Think of this situation. I used to, you know, what they call an uh, author's license. They were talking about, you know, this. Angels, God was saying these angels that I created, that I have Lucifer, whom I made from ten fiery stones. This Kerosene that is sitting in my throne, I mean around my throne, that I can cover my throne. One of the most beautiful angels I've created. And I put him in charge of this beings. They rebelled against me. Wow, can you imagine that? Anyway, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start. This time, not with the mortal beings who are spirits. I'm going to start with beings who are flesh and blood. But they're not going to be like these angels. I want to give them my very nature. I will share my nature with them. But, you know, these angels sin. Now, they're going to have to burn and lake of fire. So, forever and ever. Alright? I want these people that I create. Flesh and blood. And those who chose to go the way of Lucifer and his what thought of angels, I can destroy them to the fire. But those who chose to follow my will and to listen to what I say, then I will give them my nature. That's what God said. And the angels will be saying, you will do what? So how do you want to do that? Oh, I'm just going to grow them flesh and blood. But when I do it, you see that same devil. I will allow him to go to the place where I will put them. And I'll let him talk to them. Offer them to decide to make choices for themselves. Or allow them to let me be the one to tell them what is good and what is bad. You will do what? Ah, you know this guy is wise. He's been living for millions and millions of years. I know. But I still want people to show whether they will choose. But the thing is that the likelihood is there that they will not listen. Or God will have chosen to know because he can know tomorrow, is it? Ah, they're going to fall. And when they fall, I have to destroy them. But I will make a plan by which I can bring them back to me. And that plan involves that somebody has to die for them. Because without the shedding of blood, there will be no forgiveness. So, Jesus said, yeah, you know, I agree, I like that plan. I will actually, at the right time, I will go and die for them. And the angels, I can imagine Michael, Gabriel, and the rest of the angels say, sorry, come again. You say you will go on. You will go, go where? Go down. You will become flesh and blood. And you will die for them. Like David asks, Psalm 8, Who is man? What is man? That you value him so much. I know someone who has a nice dog. She loves that dog. Probably know that person too. Dog is like a baby. Hey, my dog is hey, hey, dog, eat now. Please eat now. 
Do you think if the dog needs a kidney, this person can donate a kidney to the dog? <laughs> I seriously doubt. And this is Christ saying, I will go down and give my life for them. What does that tell us? Have we marked that one? As far as Christ is concerned, we matter. So Christ, people really matter to Christ. You know, they brought a lady that they said was caught red-handed in adultery. Something God forbid. And they said, what do we do? The Lord says, stone her to death. That person mattered to God. It, she mattered to Christ. Christ started writing on the ground. Okay, those of you who have nothing similar. Cast the first stone. Little children who are brought to Christ. The disciples said, no, 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 don't bring that. You know, these children, they will probably will pull his bed, or they will stay in his clothes, or they will wee on him. Say, infants, people he could obviously carry on his hands. So they must be small enough. You know, the way children could be very naughty or unruly. As far as Christ was, kept, was concerned, those children mattered to him. There was a widow who went into the temple and offered an offering that was just a mite. A small, insignificant value compared to the many other people there who had plenty and they were bringing out. I don't know whether I mentioned this before. In the synagogue of those days, they used to have these horns, hollow horns made of brass on the sides. And when people go in, they drop their offerings inside. People who used to like having plenty of money. So as they put it inside, the thing, they will be putting their small small set. So as it's going, cruh, 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 just rolling down, people hear the sound. Ah, wow, this might give him plenty of offering. The widow's coin will probably just go and let him make a single sound. Just go and But they don't drop, cruh, 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 cruh. they just push it one like this. Just like people who carry one and do like this. You know? Something like that people do. That little widow's offering matters to Christ. When Lazarus died, his friend, Christ went. Lazarus mattered. Martha mattered. Mary mattered. That people could also see what he could do. That he has the power to even raise up the dead. That has power of death. He went there. People mattered to Christ. We need to understand that we matter to him. And if we matter to him, we need to understand every individual around us also matters to Christ. You know what the scripture says again? The scripture says, your life is significant. If it's not significant, maybe we will still not be alive. We may think what we're going through is something that, you know, hey, maybe I've not seen this kind of thing before. Maybe it's too much trouble, or maybe I cannot have... If we're not valuable to God, He could take us out easily. But we're valuable to Him. His Son came and died for us. He put you around people, and He put people around you so that we can value one another. And it's not because we are really super good, or because we deserve all those things that we think we want. It's because God's grace is always there. And His grace is unending. So brethren, your life is very significant. I want us to remember that. Note this fact. Your life is significant. And there's a reason that we are here. You and I. There's a reason we are on this planet. That you are in this congregation. That you are where you are. And that reason is God wants you to recognize that the people He has placed you in fellowship with are important to you. And we need to make sure we treat them as people who matter. Grace of, will see our past. It doesn't neglect what we're doing. It doesn't neglect our mistakes. But it's mostly his concern about our future. He sees our past. He's aware of our present. But he's focusing on what we can be. He's focusing on our future. John 13. 
from verse 34. John 13, verse 34. Look at what he says. This is something we all know. A new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another as I have loved you. Why is it a new commandment? The old commandment says love one another as you love yourself. We love ourselves to the point where we take ourselves away from harm. We will run from anything that will cause us harm. But how did Christ love us? As I said earlier, it is because he loves us that he stayed on the cross. It's not because he couldn't prevent himself from being there. The scripture says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the death on the cross. So he's saying, love one another to the point where you can put yourself in harm's way for someone else. The way we talk to one another, the things we say to one another, we need to weigh the impact of it. Does it build or does it destroy? The way we relate to one another, does it discourage or does it encourage? For every careless word we utter, it says we shall be brought into judgment and we will give account of it. So let's understand that we matter to God. And people matter to God. And to treat ourselves as we want ourselves to be treated. The golden rule. The new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this all we know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. I looked at the world's population today. And this figure that you see here is constantly changing. See that link at the bottom? If you click on that link, if I click on it now, it will immediately open a website where I got this from. And you will see the figures changing. You see that sign under the number that says view all people on one page. If you click on it, it shows you the value. And it shows you an icon that represents human beings. And then you see another button that says see as we are growing. And when you click it, you just see that number just growing, just growing, just growing, just growing like that. Every second people have been born. Today, about an hour plus ago when I looked it, when I checked this up, a little over 170,000 people have been born. Right now, maybe a little over 250,000 will have been born today. Imagine this was this morning. At the end of today, how many people will have been born today? They look at the deaths, number of people dying. That's why the population is growing. They said the world will be almost one and a half times. By 2050, it will increase exponentially by 2050. 74,000 plus people have died in the last one hour. I mean, as at one hour ago. So at the end of today, how many people will have died? You and I, by His grace, will probably still be here. We need to recognize that no matter what is happening around us, that we are important to God. He doesn't forget who we are. He doesn't take His eyes away from us. A single hair on our head does not fall on the ground without His knowledge. We matter to God. Everyone, I'm not talking only of those within the body of Christ, Everyone, Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Everyone, the world and all who dwell therein. And that's why God inspired Paul to write Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, to all, as we have that opportunity. It is not our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our neighbors, my family, or the beggar on the street. The individual you see who approaches you on the road. The people you do not know but ask you for help. Scripture says, let us do good to all men. As we have opportunity, as the situation presents itself. Yesterday I went to the 
streets, not too far from here, to give a job to a printer. As I was coming there, this elderly man, probably in his 70s, may look older than that. May, I mean, he may not be at all, maybe, you know, situation, circumstances may make him look that old, but he looked old in his 70s. And he was wearing one old, very old, very yellow, dead, dirty clothes. And he was, he was walking and chuckling. It was very hard for him to walk. So as we're walking, I was just wondering, he said, that man, who knows what the circumstances are social on this man? He should be somewhere in his house with his children taking care of him, or his grandchildren looking at him, or maybe his retirement plan taking care of him. If he doesn't have a retirement plan, he should be at least, there should be somewhere that he can call your home, that he has relatives or families or children who will be looking at him. But who knows his circumstances or his situation? Maybe he has no one. It's easy to think he has to be a wicked guy. I mean, these are the kind of men that have been very wicked to their children, and their children have abandoned them in their old age, and that's why they are they're suffering. You know, it's easy to think like that. There are people like that. I've seen it. That their parents are so difficult, so wicked, so bad to their children, that in their old age, the children don't want to have anything to do with them. I've seen old women at garages. There are plenty around the Bible. Maybe other places, but that's where I often see them. When you are in the park in the Bible, and Moleti or Challenge or whatever, you see these old women, probably in their 60s or 70s, coming up, begging you and praying for you, asking to give them something. I want to be lonely and hungry, give me money for food or buy food for me or something like that. I used to observe for years, most people just ignore them. Most people just ignore them. Nobody wants to. You give them money. What are they, what are they doing? Why are they not working? What have they done when they were young? Why didn't they prepare for the future? So many things could come to our minds. I look at those people and I say to myself, this is a child that God created. And as insignificant as this person's life is right now, as ragged and as dirty and as old and as worthless as they look, unworthy of attention or anything as they look, this person matters to God. I tell myself that. And as I was walking down, I watched people, I actually counted. Subconsciously, I observed a lot of things, you know. And I watched people as everybody was passing, some people, and I think as the people were passing, the man would stop and maybe beg them for, I didn't know what it was, but I know he would, he would talk to this person, people would just walk past and go. And then he continued shortening down, and then somebody, he would, he would just walk past the door. That's what I was like. When I got close to the man, as I was passing by, I side the path. Just not, please help me. I'm hungry. I've not eaten since. Please help me. I'm hungry. I took one step forward and I stopped. And I brought that money in my hand and I gave the man money. The man looked at the money. He looked. He, he, he was walking like this. I think he looked at the money. He raised up his head. He raised up his head and looked at me. I just gave him and just walked away. He was like, started praying. So I just walked away. One woman was selling something just beside the road. And I think she saw the money I gave the man. And the woman looked at me. She said, come and buy something from me now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come and buy something from me now. <laughs> the truth is that it may have been a privilege that I could give that much that money to that man. But I know it, it may not be believable. It's not because that money had no use. It's not because I had too many money in my hand to spare. It was not because, you know, I already didn't have things to use that money for. I didn't have things to do with that money. They say every lizard is lying on the ground, right? You're not the one that has to mark me. Say I'm wearing a suit like this, like <laughs> You don't know whether I'm cold or not. Or whether I'm hot or not. But my point is, scripture says, as we have opportunity, and I saw that as an opportunity. An opportunity. Whatever it is that is possible in my own way, let me help that person. You know the Boko Haram terrorists. The people who became terrorists all over the world. The people who are gang members. There are some 
people around the Kotsum and Lagos environment that I have in Lagos, they call them, they are young, young boys. Is it million boys or something they call them? One million boys. Young, young boys, they said, that they are thugs and, you know, hooligans, that they can come in mass and they go, they rob people, they can kill, they can do whatever they like. And I used to think, these may be boys that were unfortunate to be born into families where the parents just don't care. And I've seen people like that. Growing up in Jigo, I've known some of these people who have six, seven, eight children. And they're busy going out, just drinking and whatever. They don't care how those children take care of themselves. And those children, you see them becoming bus conductors from the age of seven, eight, nine. And then some may go and learn various trades. I know someone who actually brought this son to my dad and said, look, this one, I want something to be different. I want to be educated. Let me raise it. The man had probably over 70 or so children. Some of them, I had when people come to their door, they would say, you go and bring your mom, let me see your mom. Because he doesn't know, he has multiple wives, he doesn't know which one at all, how many has children. So, someone who is a talk, maybe a drug dealer, Maybe a kingpin, an area man or boy chieftain or someone, a, a Muslim fanatic or someone, a cleric somewhere, will see those boys and bring them together and give them food and show them affection and show them that they matter, that they are important and they have allegiance to those people. Those are the people who grow up to become terrorists. To become area boys. They are the ones who will be asked, go kill those people, go rob those people. They feel the obligation to do those because those people make them feel important. You see those 19 people who bombed themselves in the four planes, the hijacked the four planes in the World Trade Center attack. There are people who maybe their lives almost mean nothing. And someone came and was taking care of them and decided to take care of their families, their relatives, and they said, look, what we want you for to do is to do this. And you know, when you do this, you will have somewhere in heaven where God will bless you, and give you lots of food, and blah, 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 and all this. And we'll take care of the family, and they will go out and do it. Imagine, I used to think about, imagine a boy who is, I used to see those people sitting in the middle of the road, at the Benda, at the Constant Road, and you see those boys that are two years old, three years old, and some of the girls, maybe like seven, eight years old, where they come to and they pay to all your and they're asking for money. And I have said to my friend, come on, go and meet your mom. Where is your father? Why are they sitting there? And it's true, some of them, they would rather sit there and begging for whatever they can get on a daily basis than maybe find meaningful work. But you know that's true, there are people like that. If those children have been told that, you see all these people you see who are working out, and they dress nice, and they wear and they are inside vehicles. They are wicked. They don't care about you. In this world, nobody cares about you. Okay? You get what you want. You take what you can get. It is a dog in dog world. You look out for number one. Nobody cares about you. So don't think that some people will have mercy on you, have pity on you. So when you go out and you are begging people for money, they will give you nothing, okay? They are selfish, they are egotistical, they are this, they are that, they don't care about us, okay? But when you're going out and beg like that, we will take care of you. What you should do is, if you have an opportunity to pick someone's pocket, pick their pocket. Don't feel it's a bad thing to do. Don't feel it's a wrong thing to do. Because if you have been nice and you think they will have mercy on you, they will look at how small you are, or you carry your sister and you think you are, you are hungry, they don't care. You must look out for yourself. And those children go to ten they go to ten people. And the people just ignore them. There are some days that if you come there, we will slap you. Some people tell them like that. Or oh, they are following somebody's vehicle. Some people will say, My friend, come, come and get out of here. And when they keep coming, they just roll up the glass. Maybe some people pour water on themselves. And the children, what can they do now? That thing they keep telling them, they are enforcing it to them. Uh, they, are, they are taking it in. As they grow older, when they now tell them, see that house, the window is small. I can't enter, but you can't enter. Well, yeah, climb in, go inside. 
sleep whatever I can get. They will do it easily. For oh, those I've seen people I meet on the road, you know, they are like them. I see them on the road, they never give me a call. But who knows whether out of ten people, maybe three, four people will be nice to them. I see people sometimes who will come and bring pots and they will be giving them rice. I see people, I've seen people come and give them takeaway packs. And in my opinion, I used to feel those little, little acts of kindness. When the time comes and they say, okay, this is the this is the plan we have been planning for this thing. That's why we have put, I'm just saying, all these backers and all these streets. That's why many of you have been brought down to Lagos. So yeah, let's take over Lagos and Islamize it. We have gone around and start killing people. You may find some of those women, some of those beggars, and some of those boys, who will not imbibe the total ideology of these people don't care about you. They are wicked, they are evil, kill all of them. You may find some of them who will actually go and warn people. Say, look, this is what's going to happen. It's going to start next week. You need to take care of yourself. You need to protect yourself. You will find Okada men, though balance, who will tell customers who have, they have been carrying, say, look, by next week, this is what's going to happen. Please, don't come out of your house. Or so so and so. Because they have been related with as people who matter. And not just, you know, Aboki who is a dustbin person. Or Aboki who is a biker. Or a beggar who is in my street or who is in the market or so and so. People have treated them in a way that shows they matter. Good begets good. And evil begets good. And you break the cycle of evil by putting good in between. John chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Again, I just want to use this to bring up a point. Okay? Before opening this, if you look at the Ten Commandments, look at the first four commandments. It's talking about our relationship to God. Is it not? No other gods before me. No idols. Don't say God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Those are talking about how we relate to God. You know what the next six talk about? How do you relate to other people? All the rest of them, honor your father, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't commit. They are all about other people. How you interact with external people. So we must understand that not only do we matter to God, the people around us also matter. And if we relate with them in a way that matters, then we begin to evaluate and elevate even our own significance before God as well. In John chapter 4, Jesus Christ, we know what happens in John chapter 4. If I mention it, I think you remember. When the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed once again to Galilee. Look at that verse 4. But he needed, he didn't say he has to. The word that they use, needed, means it was imperative. So it's not saying that it's the, that's the only way I actually, you look at the map, you realize there are places for ways to get to that place. But he decided that I need to pass through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. You continue reading that story, time is going, so I want to read the scriptures. What happened in Samaria? He got there, he saw a well, he said, let me rest there and sat by the well. And told Simon to go get something for us to eat. And you know the Samaritan woman that you saw there, right? This is why like, these people are not even Christian. They're not even Jews. They're not Judaic. They don't even believe. That they're not children of Israel. They were transported from elsewhere and brought to that place. And they are second class Christians, so to say. The Jews only want to regard them as true Jews. They were insignificant as far as they were concerned. And that's why in the story of the good Samaritan, he used a Samaritan as an example of a neighbor. 
Someone the Jews look down on. Somebody they feel is insignificant. The people they believe do not matter. People that as far as they were concerned, they are beneath them. They are less than people they should ever talk to, interact with. Christ uses it to shame them, to let them know that every individual matters to God. And he knew that that Samaritan woman had some problems in her life. She's been married multiple people and, you know, it hasn't worked. Even the person she's, constant, she's currently married to, she's currently, she's currently even living with, is not even her husband. And he knew this woman needed him. And he went there specifically for that purpose. And the woman was instrumental in getting the people of the town to understand and to know Christ and his will. That's how God interacts with us. And here's the concluding part of this message. We will meet people around us. Either actively or indirectly. Something may bring them to come into your contact. Paul, I've sent Paul to you about before, isn't it? To meet the total stranger. Just to know the person because of certain things. Paul has gone to the Korodu, isn't it? A number of places. I think we both gone to Abekuta before. It. And they're quite a lot like that, really. It's not necessarily because one has the ability, but because of recognizing that individuals and people matter to God. And how we treat others has it an impact on how we also are responded to by God. Is that scriptural? For with the measure we measure, we shall be measured also. Do I know where my children will be in the next 20 years, the next 30 years? Do I want favor and grace to follow them and to accompany them? Do I want them to need help and to have someone to go to help them? They talk to who doesn't know them, who has no impact, no reason to assist them. Then let me teach everybody the same way. Scurals will often take seeds, okay? Nuts. And they will carry them, and they will dig the ground, and they will bury them there. And they don't remember where they buried them. Because they are buried in different places. So that when they are hungry, they can go and take the food. But they can't remember all the places they buried food. And that's why you have trees growing in unlikely places that's providing shade, and taking care of the soil, providing top cover of the soil in many forests, in many places. We should do good as well. And forget about doing it. Someone will benefit from it. Cast your bread upon the waters. After many days, you will find it. After many days, you will find it. So, who is supposed to be open, welcome, generous, valuing and treating people with respect in a way that shows they matter? Okay, God can do so. But also we, who are part of God's body, who are those who have been called by God, anyone who says I'm a child of God, who has the Spirit of God, anyone who is a Christian also has that responsibility. It's not only maybe the pastors, you know, maybe the deacons, you know, maybe those who are so-called court leaders, maybe those who have it all, or whatever. You and I, God's spirit is with you and is in you. And you are part of the body of Christ. You have that responsibility. Look at Revelation 22, verse 17. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride. Who is the bride? The bride is what? Is it not the church? Is the bride not the church? And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hear say, come. And we are the ones listening to God's word. And we are the ones who have been called to be part of the bride. And we should have that attitude of seeing everybody matters and be willing to say, come. 
to be able to offer a welcoming hand, to be able to offer the hand of fellowship, a hand of encouragement. We should be open, we should be generous, we should be friendly, we should be people who actually ask people to come. We should be people who take people to us. That's what it says, the spirit and the bride. We of all should be so open and so generous and valuing people, everyone around us, the way we relate to them. Our work should build them up, should encourage people, should strengthen people. That's how we should be. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water out of life and free. So we need to be able to open our arms and invite people to us by the way we interact with them. That can only come if we know that they matter. And if we understand how much we matter to God and how much value also places on us. John Maxwell is a writer writes many books. One of his writings, he said, the first question a follower will ask of a leader is not whether are you competent. They rarely ask, are you competent? Or are you going to help me? The first word they often will ask or that they think about is they will look at the leader and they want to decide to follow him is, do you care for me? Can this person care for me? Does this person even have feelings for me? Is this person concerned enough about me as an individual? Because it's when there is that care and that concern that people begin to take steps to do things for people, isn't it? Why do we have leaders in this country who only look after themselves? Obviously because they don't care about the people they're supposed to be, isn't it? They're concerned about what they get and how they are taking care of themselves and how people see them. That's all. There's no real care. And the reason for that is said, because we don't want to submit our lives to someone who might hurt or manipulate us in some way. So the question of care is one that's significant in our life. Because the first step to trust, to trust, which is the first step to a relationship. My final scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. To conclude my statement that you matter to God and people matter to God. He's talking about the will of God. And the will of God is that all men, and it says all men. Remember I started that when you look at the fact that God called Israel. And he, why did he call all the rest? All the rest? God sent Jonah to the people of Nineveh. Nineveh are Syrians. What they do to those who are their enemies. If you know how they have treated their enemies, and what the Israelites have suffered under them, you will understand why Jonah absolutely refused and said to fear God. God, no baby go to those people. Those people, like lie, not in this life. In the writings of the Assyrians themselves, most of what we know about them is passed down in their military writings. The Assyrians, when they capture enemies, They will line up the men, the women, and the children. They will kill the parents and give their heads to the children to carry around as they are taking them to another town. They will kill the children and give to the mothers to carry their bodies or their head. And put it on their head and be walking as they are taking them to where they will put them. They will take some of the enemies, remove their tongue, remove one eye. Then they will cut off this elbow, cut off this elbow, and cut off one leg, and tell them to be hopping on that one leg. Their writings describe how wicked. They, they, they've invented ways of torturing people that only the Romans came close to matching them. And you can understand when Jonah was told to go talk to them, he absolutely did not want to. Because of one fact. You know why he didn't want to go? He said, God, in summary, all Jonah's reason was that, God, people matter to you too much. That's all. That's why. Ah, people, people matter to you too much. Everybody matters to you. You are too merciful. They, I will go and tell them now that they're going to do this and then they will decide to repent. And you will not kill them. You will not. No, I will refuse to go. He knows that people matter to God. 
and they do matter to him. So when Timothy said that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but that he wants all men, and that knowledge comes only through the Holy Days. It explains how God's plan is for everyone who has ever lived to come to the knowledge of the truth and to be saved. That truth requires a page added to it. I didn't copy that. I tested it Who will have all men to be saved and to come on the knowledge of the truth? In case you think I forgot the page. I just missed it. It's still truth written there, just that I don't know what that word means. <laughs> so come to the knowledge of the truth. People matter to God. You know, there might be people who irritate us. There might be people who we know are enemies, they do not like us. There might be people we know, they will lie, they will smile to our face, and they lie behind our back. They will talk nice to you. They will greet you nicely. They will play with you. But the things they talk and say behind you when you're not there. Probably when you, when you hear they want to remove their head. There may be people who you will think are your friends. And they will say, oh, you're a nice guy. Oh, you're a nice girl. Why? You know, I really appreciate what you're doing. But behind you, Rush, idiot. See, this come up on hair. See her hair. She has no even get hair for front. Ah, see her nose. Eh? See, they will, in fact, they will call A, B, and Z. And see, the things they are saying behind your back, and the things they are saying just to assassinate your character, more or less, slander they are mentioned behind you. If you hear some of them, it's like, okay, as far as I'm concerned, this person is a non entity. I will never talk to them, I will never relate to them, I'll never. Now that's hard to not do. It's only when you understand that you matter to God. And even those people matter to God. And God relates with all of us, it's irrespective of how we are. Scripture, scripture says at the right time. Why was it not God? God demonstrated his love. Christ died for the God. Who was Judas? He was a thief. He was greedy. And he was the one who was going to betray Jesus. Did Jesus know? How did he relate to Judas? You think as he moved around, he snaps at Judas anyhow. He doesn't talk to him. He gives him a distance. This is your I know what his plan is. He thinks I don't know what is in his mind. Oh, yesterday when he went out, he went to meet the Pharisees, negotiating how much he will use to betray me. <laughs> now he's coming to come and I just let me just put him in his place. Does he do that? He doesn't do that. But he knows who he was. He knows who he is. He knows who we will do. But that's that's Christ. Judas still matter. Guess what he did? The night when they were to have their last supper. Where was Judas sitting? You know, he said, the person who might put this food inside and I give to it. Obviously, he was sitting close to him. Judas, you can sit here. Maybe the guy wants to sit there. You know, you know what you sit there? I don't want this guy to sit there. I don't know. I may just look at him and I feel like punching him. I mean, it was like saying, Judas, let your head turn to my head. I may feel tempted to just do that. Jesus used his hand to feed Judas, even though he knows he was going to sell him out. He was going to introduce him to people who were killing for the kids. Now that's hard. Do not resist an evil person, he says. If someone wants to take your throat, give him your throat. If someone slaps you on the, on the right, turn the left. Why will Christ say those things? It's because people matter to Christ. We matter to Him. Irrespective of what we do, we matter to Christ. We have value before Him. So brethren, as we go out and live our lives, as we interact with people around us, in this life, in this planet, Every human being that we meet, every opportunity that we have, 
to treat people as significant, to show value to every individual, to show that people matter to us, and to remind ourselves that we matter to God. So much so, Christ came and died for us. And every hair on our head doesn't fall to the ground without his knowledge. That he said he will give men's life and ransom for us. That he will carry and sustain us even to our old age. That we should fear not. Little flock. That is his pleasure, his father's pleasure to give us the kingdom. Let us recognize that you matter. And that people matter. So that's all.